Okay, everybody, uh, get out your notebooks. Oh, yeah. Notebooks. Let's take a look up here. Put away phones and iPods and all that good stuff. we got a few more to do. And then we'll I'll let you go down the lap. So there's my piecewise function. Now, somebody help me out here. How do we do this? If I want to evaluate this function at 9.8, so here's, here's what we're trying to finish. What is the function evaluated at x equals 9.8? What do I have to do first before I put it in? OK, you've got to change the x's to 9.8s, which is what I've always done in the past. But the extra complication here is I've got two pieces to this function. And I can only use one of the two pieces. So how do I know which one to use? The bottom. Yeah. yeah. OK, good. 9.8 is bigger than 3. Good. So I'm going to use the bottom piece. Right? And so this is just equal to 4 times 9.8 plus 7, which just gives me 9. Now, there is a way, and I wouldn't get too hung up on this, but I'll show it to you anyway. There is a way to actually graph piecewise functions on your calculator. So let me show you, but it's almost more trouble than it's worth. So you, you, you can do this. If you go to y equals, I have my plots on. I don't want that on. Go ahead and turn that off. And then, let's see if I can remember how to do this. I haven't done this before. Uh, well, I mean, it's, I'll show you. I'll show you how to do it, but it's it's really not. I wonder if there's something. I think you use parentheses. Yeah. Does anybody remember how to do this? Yeah. Well, you, 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 you don't. No, you. you don't have to do it. You don't have to do it. But some of you might want to. You might want to do this. This actually will give you a graph of piecewise functions. So you can tune that. You feel free to tune this out if you want to. Here's how you do it. You you put the the trick is you're just going to put the 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 function in parentheses. So all this stuff is going to go in parentheses, and then right next to it, the domain goes in parentheses, and that's it. So it's not that bad. So I could say in parentheses, I could say four x plus eight. And then in parentheses next to that, I just put the condition that x is less than or equal to 3. So, okay, here's, which is something you're going to need to know anyway, so I'll show you that. So when you want to do the less than or equal to, you go to the math menu, and you go to uh, probability. Hang on a sec. No, it's test. Never mind. It's, it's behind the math menu. It's test. Thank you. So you see behind math, it says test, it will go second. Math brings us to the test menu, and there they all are. See all the you can do. I mean, you can even do a not equal to on here, which is kind of cool. And later on, we'll we'll get to some of that. But for now, we just want it looks like number six. Okay, and there it is. So x is less than or equal to three. You know, you have an option here. I can just add to that. I can say plus the other part of the piecewise function. But personally, I think it's better to just graph each piece on a different line. Go down to Y2, exactly. So go down to Y2, and then in parentheses, we'll put 4x plus 7. Um, and then 
in parentheses. We've got x is second test 3 greater than. And then if I just hit, we'll just hit zoom 6 to start with. It's probably going to not look real good, but there it is. It's a pretty steep function. So maybe I, instead I want to do something like go zoom. If I go to the window, notice that x minimum is negative 10, so that's the left edge of the screen. The right edge is at positive 10. If I want to let the calculator set the y's, do you remember the trick? Zoom. What do I do? If I want to, I choose the x's, but I'm going to let it figure out the y's. Do you remember what zoom trick it is? Zero. Zoom zero. Yep. I go zoom zero, which is zoom fit. And it'll fit the y values to my x values so I can see this thing. And so there it is. It graphs it in two pieces, and they just barely miss. Right? There's just a little bit of a jag in that function, but that's it. Okay? <coughs> Make sense? Okay. Not that big a deal, frankly, but that's how you do it. Okay, so. Moving on. Uh, what about this guy? If a line passes through the point 8, negative 9, and it's parallel to the line y equals negative 4 11ths x minus 10, we want to know the value of b. So what's, our, what's always our trick for finding the value of b, the y-intercept? Plug all my information in. Good. So we're going to start with, we're going to start with y equals mx plus b. And I got to plug stuff in for everything except B, right? So in this case, what's what's my slope? It's negative four eleven. How'd you get that? Um, so it's the slope of the line that's parallel oh. to the curve. Good, good. Okay, so we know that we're if we're parallel to this line, well, there's the slope of the line. It's just in y equals m x plus b form, right? And so m is just the coefficient of x. So we can see m is negative 4 11. It's good. And then what's my point? So what's a point that, that on my line? No. What's, I, I need to be able to plug in values of x and y. So that would have to be a solution. That's got to be an ordered pair. Remember, what that means, if a point sits on the line, then its x and y values work in the equation, right? So I want an ordered pair of a, of a point that's actually a part of that line. Negative 8, 9, right there. Right? That's a point that my line goes through. So, so there's my x value and my y value, right? I can plug all that stuff in. So I get 9 equals negative 4 elevenths times negative 8 over 1, right, plus b. So what are the steps I would go through then to solve for b? Yeah, I just multiply the fractions straight across. And let's see, then I'm going to get negative times negative, positive. 4 times 8? 4 times 8? 32, good. And then... So my answer then is just, it just wants a decimal. So I'm just going to go on to any calculator. It doesn't have to be a graphing calculator and just do 9 minus. And then if I want to treat a fraction like a number, what's my trick? Put it in parentheses. So 9 minus 32 elevenths. And that's it. Okay, direct variation. Okay, this is an easy one. Direct variation, uh, remember, means this. That's the direct variation equation, but in order for it to be direct variation, the k has to be a constant, right? So all we have to do here is just see if the k is in fact a constant. I'll just check each of these ordered pairs and see. Well, if I plug 30 in for y, 
and 3 in for x, k is just going to be 30 over 3, right? Which is 10. Okay, so the value of k there would be 10. What about here? Uh, sorry, it'd be 20, wouldn't it? Not, not 10. 10, right. 60 divided by 3 would be 20. What about here? If I plug those values in, 120 for y and 6 for x, does that work? 20 times 6 is 120, isn't it? Right? Does it work here? 20 times 9, yeah, it's 180. Does it work here? 20 times 12 is 240. 20 times 15 is 300. So it checks out all the way through. The value of k would be the same, right? And so it is direct variation. And then the instructions say, if it is direct variation, enter the value of k. So what's k? 20, right? So that's what we'd enter. Okay. Now, if even one of these points hadn't worked, if k had been different for one of those ordered pairs, then it's not constant and it's not direct variation. And then we would just enter 999. All right, last one, last one. Now this is this isn't a hard one, but I want you to see what's going on here. There, there's a there's an issue that this is a commonly missed problem, not because it's really conceptually difficult, but because people all make the same mistake. If I'm calculating a rate of change, here's what people tend to do: they know we're calculating change in temperature over change in time, right? So we can call it. Try to fix it here. Capital T will be temperature. Small t will be time. Delta just means changing. So this is our math way of saying change in temperature over change in time. Well, the change in time is a little bit awkward because we're going from 3 p.m. one day to 7 a.m. the next day. So what's the way we can think about that, John? Okay. Well, let's start with the first one. Okay, plus. Wait. Let, let, let's get the change in time first. How much time elapses? And what's awkward here is it's a clock. It's got, it's got 12 hours on the dial instead, right? So how'd you get how'd you get that though? Um, three to three is 12 okay. Hours, and then Good way to think of it. 3 p.m. to 3 a.m. the next day is 12 hours, and then we got to go four additional hours to get to 7 a.m. Right? So we know that the change in time is going to be 16 hours. But the change in temperature. Here's the issue that people have trouble with on this. If, if the temperature is starting out at 66 and ending up at 38, people look at that and they tend to think, oh, well, the change, or the change in temperature is going to be 66 minus 38 is what, 28, right? And they, and they get 28 degrees Fahrenheit, but that's not right. What should it be? Negative. should be negative. should be negative because it's starting at a value of 66 and it's ending up at a value of 38. So it actually changed in a negative way, it decreased, right? Now here's the rule. When you look for a change in a quantity, let's say we're finding the change in y, it's always equal to the final value of that quantity, in this case y, so y final minus y initial. Always take the final value and subtract the starting value from it. So in this case we'd take the final value of 38 degrees and subtract 66 and get negative 28 16 which is what? Um, I don't know, it's going to be some decimal. 1.75, negative 1.75 degrees Fahrenheit per hour. And that negative is important. What's it mean if it's changing at a rate of negative 1.75 degrees per hour? It's going down. It's going down. you got to know it. Pack the right clothes, right? Okay, make sense? I always know that. Do yeah. you? By definition, it makes sense. Right clothes. You never see me wearing pants. Always have a door to 